Thanksgiving Sunday, and I'd like to say something really positive and thankful. <coughs> but we're going to talk about James chapter 3, and it's a really hard passage. So I ask for your patience this morning. We're going to talk about a passage that I have found to be quite negative. Uh, and we're going to do it on Thanksgiving, and, and trust that, uh, that God has something to say to us uh, in the midst of a, a challenging text. We've been going through the, God, or the, the book of James, the epistle of James, for the last uh, month or so. And as we've done it, we've been learning about the, the culture to which James was writing. And we've learned that, uh, that we've had to kind of take into account the fact that James is writing to a, a predominantly a pre-literate culture. He's, talk, he's speaking to a culture that has a, a significant Greek influences and a strong value on teaching. We've got the synagogue system and kind of this uh, stratified, kind of highly structured society where the people who have the information tend to be the people who have power and, and authority and influence. Uh, and, and really what we're seeing as we read through the book of James is that James is deeply concerned that somehow the church, in, in the midst of, of growing and developing and becoming this, this body that serves, uh, he's worried that they're becoming increasingly influenced by the culture that's around them. He's concerned that the way that they're acting is reflecting more and more of the culture that, in which they find themselves, rather than kind of at the heart of the gospel. So in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about kind of this faith versus works, the, the, the sphere that James has that, that he sees in the way that they're acting, that they're more concerned with the ideas of faith, rather than the practical doing, the, the living out of faith. We see in James's writing as well that he's concerned that, that they're taking better care of the rich rather than the poor and that the, the values of the culture around them are starting to seep into the church so that the people who have money find themselves with, with more authority, with more privilege, and the people who don't find themselves pushed to the margins. And we see that what James is concerned with here is that the church would reflect the gospel of Jesus and not just the culture around them. I say this because as we begin to read this text, I, I want you to have those thoughts in mind so that you can hear the text in a way that... that the original audience would have heard. So as we launch in here, we're going to read from, uh, <clears throat> from James chapter 3, and I want you to keep those ideas in mind. One, one last idea that I'll put out there before, before we read. Uh, James is also concerned that he, we need to keep in mind that the people that he, to whom he's writing are people who don't actually have the New Testament yet. So in the absence of authoritative writing, we have a higher value on apostles, right? And on teachers, because who's the one who gets to decide right from wrong? It's the person who stands up on a, on a Sunday or on a Saturday and, and actually says something from the front. So James is concerned that, that, that the people who say those things would be people who are informed by the right things. And it's important for us to keep that in mind as he begins to talk about teachers. So James chapter 3, I'm going to read from the ESV. You've got NIV Bibles in your pews. Uh, this is good. This gives us a couple different angles. Here's what it says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Just want to pause there and say, it's good for me to say that out loud. It's good for all of us to stop and acknowledge. James points it out right at the beginning. People who teach say the wrong things sometimes. They stumble in many ways. Anyone who doesn't stumble is perfect. Verse 3. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire, and, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
Does a, spring, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So James says some hard things here. In fact, he tries to soften it. You can tell in his writing that he's trying to soften the, the kind of the hard edge of what he's saying by, by throwing the word brother in there now and then, right? To kind of point out, we're, we're all, this is us. This is an us problem. It's not just a you problem, but, but we have this problem with our tongues. We have this problem. And, and as we walk through the kind of the, the passage again and, and think through what James is saying here, uh, here, here's what I want to highlight from what he's saying. So he starts off by talking about aspiring to teaching. And he warns them about it because of the, significant, the significance of the role, the power of teaching. He says you're going to be judged with greater strictness. And again, he's talking about the importance of teaching, particularly because of his context. Because the people who stand up wield a ton of authority. The people don't have a, a scripture to fall back on, so when somebody stands up in front of the congregation and says something, they have to discern for themselves whether it's true or not. The, the bigger challenge with that commentators would say, is that what James is experiencing is the fact that in that time, there were plenty of people who did aspire to teaching. All kinds of people who, who maybe weren't necessarily followers of Jesus, or weren't necessarily all that engaged in their walk with God, but who aspired to teaching because teaching was a role of authority. You may have seen on my first slide that, that, that I talk about the role of power. Uh, and I think what James is talking about here is power. He's concerned about the fact that people would want to grasp power for themselves for the wrong reasons, that they would want to grab authority for themselves for the wrong reasons. So he warns about he warns these aspiring teachers, not many of you should become teachers, because you'll know that you know that we'll be judged with greater strictness. And then he points out, he says, we all stumble in many ways. We're all bound to make mistakes. And then he moves on to talk about the influence of teachers. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide the whole body. As we look at ships, they're large but driven by, or guided by a very small rudder wherever the pilot directs. And what he's saying here again is he's emphasizing the fact that teachers, through what they say, have a significant influence on the direction of a congregation, on the direction of the body of Christ in a particular location. We know this. We'll talk more about what this means in our culture. He goes on in verse 5 to begin to talk not just about teachers, so he's begun with this argument about teachers, but then he kind of moves it over to something for all of us. He says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It's not just teachers who have a problem with their tongues. It's not just teachers who say the wrong thing and get things wrong, but it's all of us, or all people who get things wrong. We're, we're all people who say the wrong thing. We're all people, he says, who struggle to actually tame our tongues. And, and if you've got the sense that he's overstating it, I don't know that he is. He says that everybody gets it wrong. It's impossible to tame the tongue. But not is it just impossible to stop saying the wrong thing, but he talks about the, he, he spiritualizes it, doesn't he? He talks about the evil influence of the tongue. He's talking about spiritual destruction and the influence of hell, the influence of the enemy on our speech. So, to come back, James is concerned about teachers and the influence that they have because of the, the platform that they've been given, which I say with great irony, standing on a literal platform. So he's concerned about that. But, but then he also, he's concerned about the fact that all of us are people who get it wrong in the words that we say and the way that we interact with one another. We all need to learn the lesson of taming the tongue. And then he finishes, he finishes with an issue of integrity. He says, it makes no sense to bless God. It's incoherent to bless God and curse those who are made in his image. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. He says it makes no sense to bless God and curse people made in his image. And really what he's highlighting here in verse 10 is that the redemption process has begun. We've become people who bless God. So we can celebrate that, right? This is a thing that has happened in our lives. We've, become, we've gone from being people who have perhaps no interest in God. And now we've become people who have learned to bless God, to honor God with our tongues. And yet, at the same time, we're still people who are not quite there, because though we bless God, we also curse other people. We also use our tongues to tear other people down. 
And, and I want to highlight here that as James ends kind of this little section, he's talking about, again, about transformation, about the need for deep inner change. He's saying it, the, the gospel's gone in, and it's, created you, it's recreated you into somebody who, who loves God, and yet the gospel needs to go deeper and continue to do the work so that you would also become somebody who loves people and honors people in the way that you speak. And really, you see this clearly in the images that he chooses, don't we? Does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And what he's saying here is he's talking about where, where are the words that are in our hearts being drawn from? Where are they coming out of? What do we need to pay attention to there? So, so here's my quick three-point summary of the three kind of directions that James goes in. He says, number one, he says, be careful about aspiring to be teachers because teachers like the rest of us are imperfect people, but they exercise an outsized influence like the rudder on a boat or the bit in the horse of a mouth. Secondly, he says, like teachers, our words have an outsized influence on our relationships and our world. Unfortunately, this influence is often bad, and none of us is able to master the power of our words. And finally, he says, our inconsistency in speech isn't a side issue, but points to our need for deeper change within, because like water from a spring, our words flow forth from deep places. So, there, there's my three-point summary of where James is going. Let's talk about what it actually means. What do we actually do with this? First thing he says is this, be careful about aspiring to be teachers because teachers like the rest of us are imperfect people, but they exercise an outsized influence like the rudder on a boat or a bit in the mouth of a horse. We can think of lots of examples of this in our culture, right? We can think of all kinds of ways that this has gone good and that this has gone poorly. The picture that I've chosen there uh, is a picture of the Worldwide Church of God, a church that was started by Herbert Armstrong in the 1930s in the United States, in Pasadena. And I was in a class a couple years ago in Pasadena, and one of my classmates was somebody who grew up going to the Worldwide Church of God, and I got to hear a little bit about kind of the story of what this church was, was all about. This church was founded by Herbert Armstrong, a radio preacher. Um, it was a very legalistic church. It was, it was a cult. It was anti-Trinitarian. Uh, it spoke out vehemently against the, Trinit uh, against the Trinity, it was a doomsday church. He was focused on the end times often and kind of making declarations about when Jesus was going to come back. And by and large, they rejected most of the other parts of Christianity. It was, in, in really simple terms, a cult. They demanded tithes. They built elaborate facilities and paid their leaders millions. Now I want to read to you something off of their website from yesterday. I pulled this off their website yesterday. Here's what this website says. In the early 1930s, Herbert Armstrong began a ministry that eventually became our denomination. He founded the Worldwide Church of God, which adhered to many unusual doctrines that fell outside of orthodoxy. He taught these doctrines so enthusiastically that eventually more than 100,000 people attended weekly services. Even though much of Armstrong's doctrinal foundation was faulty, so just pause for one second, so they acknowledge openly that this guy was a false teacher, who was steered in the wrong direction. He pulled people, he pulled hundreds of thousands of people off in the wrong direction for many years. So even though Armstrong's doctrinal foundation was faulty, there were still core Christian truths to the message he preached. Many unchurched people who had little previous exposure to Christianity came to faith through his evangelical pleas. People came to Christ, accepted his death for their sins, and trusted him for salvation. Many lives were transformed from sinful and selfish to service and humility. A germ of life existed inside the crust of his erroneous doctrines. As Jesus Christ changes lives, he also has the power to change an organization. After Herbert Armstrong's death in 1986, our organization began to shift dramatically. Church leaders began to realize that many of his doctrines were not biblical. These doctrinal changes took the better part of 10 years. For example, in 1993, the church accepted the doctrine of the Trinity. The church declared that the cross is not a pagan symbol, that it is not a sin to have illustrations of Jesus, and that Christians may vote. Such changes may seem inconsequential to most Christians, but each change was significant for the church's members because each change attacked strongly held beliefs about how we ought to express our devotion to God. Our identity was based in how we were different from others. So each change had to be explained from the scriptures and had to explain how previous explanations were not correct. These were years of turmoil and tremendous reorientation as many left the church over these changes. Those who remained had to reorient themselves and fully reevaluate their relationship with God and what they believed. 
After struggling to understand the doctrinal change, many members began to experience a new sense of peace and joy through a renewed faith in Jesus Christ. Their identity was in Him, not in the particular laws they kept. Through all this, many members were transformed and rejoiced with renewed zeal for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, the leaders of this denomination reject Armstrong's doctrinal errors. We acknowledge that our errors were deep and serious, but that Christ has rescued us from them. It's amazing to think about. On the one hand, we had this negative influence, but then over a 10-year period, we have godly leaders that came along and patiently, patiently taught people who were caught in a wrong way of thinking. And because of that, I love this last line, we acknowledge that our errors were deep and serious, but that Christ has rescued us from them. I met a leader at a, at a meeting about a year ago um, here in Montreal, and, and I asked him what, what denomination he was from, and he said, oh, I'm from Grace Fellowship International, or Grace Communion International. I said, I don't think I'm familiar with them. And he said, oh, uh, we were formerly known as the Worldwide Church of God. And here's this wonderful, gracious, humble man who just took the time again to remind me of the story of how good teaching, how, how God rescued them from a wrong way of thinking. We see the influence of teachers, right? One of the things that struck me when I moved to Montreal uh, that, that was just unique to me was that John MacArthur, in, in a time where there were very few resources that were available in the French language in Quebec, John MacArthur chose to invest in translating resources and making things available for the church in Quebec. And everywhere I went in my first couple years in Montreal and around the, and around the province, I was stunned by how respected John MacArthur was. Not that he shouldn't be, but just, I was shocked. Everybody knew Jean MacArthur, and, and it was impressive to me the influence that a teacher like him has, has had on Quebec because of his willingness to invest here. Now, the principle that I see beneath the teaching on this is that those who have been granted positions of power need to exercise those positions in a way that reflect the ways of the kingdom of God and not just the kingdom of this world. We're, we're quick to go to the doctrinal answer when it comes to this, and, and I was, right? I shared with you Herbert Armstrong's false doctrine and then the way that it changes when, when you get good teaching in place. But, but James isn't just concerned that the church would have right doctrine in front of them, preached from the pulpit. That, that wasn't his only concern. Because when you, read through the, when you read through the book of James, he's concerned that the people who teach would have an ethic would have a way of living that reflected the way that Jesus lived and taught. He wasn't just concerned that they would say the right things, but that they would have a different relationship with power. He's concerned about the way that power is exercised in the church. That, that's why he says you're, you're, people are, 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 uh, are desiring to take on leadership. They're desiring to, to be teachers. They're aspiring to be teachers. He's saying be, be careful about aspiring to be teachers. Because the way of Jesus isn't that we would simply take on authority and power so that we would lord it over others. I mean, this is what we see with the disciples, right? Jesus, Jesus, which one of us gets to be at your right hand? And which one of us gets to be at your left? Who's going to be the greatest of us? And Jesus calls them out on it and says, no, no, that's not leadership in the kingdom of God. Whoever wants to lead needs to become a servant. And I think James is concerned about the, the right message being proclaimed, but he's also concerned about the right message being proclaimed in the right way, by people whose character reflect the ways of Jesus. This is why he's talking about treating the rich better than the poor, and warning about that. This is why he's, he's kind of working through kind of not just kind of information, not, not just the faith, but, but the doing, the, the acting, faith and works. Well, how does faith and works apply to this kind of a, to this kind of a concern? Maybe the question might be, how does Jesus use power in a way that's distinct and different from the culture around him? I'll give you one idea. I think we looked at this as a congregation within the last year, the story of Jairus. Um, so, recap of the story, Jesus comes back across the, across the lake, he lands, Jairus, this very important synagogue official, comes running to meet him, falls down on his knees in front of Jesus and says, come to my house, my little girl is dying. And immediately we've got this scene where Jesus is being ushered through crowds of people who are crowding around to try to get close to him, to try to get to Jairus' house, this very important official. And then as he's kind of pushing his way through the crowd and working his way to Jairus' house to try to save his little girl, 
Suddenly Jesus recognizes that power has gone out from him and somebody has touched him. And he stops everything and he says, somebody touched me. And of course, Peter's not happy about this. Why are we stopping? Why are we stopping? We're going to get to Jairus' house. And, and, but Jesus says, somebody touched me and he stops everything. And he won't move on until they identify who touched him. And it turns out to be this woman who has had a, it says, a hemorrhaging blood for the last, uh, I can't remember the, the amount of time, it was years and years. 12 years. So we've got this woman who sneaks up to Jesus. She doesn't even dare approach him face to face. She sneaks up to him in the midst of a crowd and touches him, and immediately she's healed. And Jesus stops everything and makes her tell her story in front of the entire crowd. We make a big deal of the healing in the story, but really there's a power dynamic that's at play in that story, right? The awkwardness of the story is that Jesus is willing to stop for a, a woman who has lost everything. It says that one of the versions says that she's lost all of her money in the pursuit of, of treatment. And Jesus stops everything to deal with her. He stops everything when he's on his way to the wealthy synagogue leader, the influential, important leader. Jesus stops everything to deal with her. And part of what Jesus is communicating in this story is that he doesn't esteem one person as better than another. You can be poor, you can be an outcast, you can be unclean, and yet he will stop and actually care for you. Not just the synagogue leader. That's the way that Jesus dealt with power. So, so you, you might understand then why James is concerned that in a church where people are aspiring to leadership, they, they want to be the ones who have power, he's concerned that they would hold on to the teachings of Jesus, the, the way of Jesus, the way that Jesus interacted with power, where Jesus didn't see anybody as more important or less important, but he loved everybody. And he loved the people who were unlovable. Jesus stops, he values, he restores dignity, he goes beyond healing. He actually restores this woman to her community by making her tell her story in front of everybody. Jesus consistently lives out what he tells the disciples about leadership and power. Luke 22, he says, Let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. <coughs> so, on the one hand, we've got to get the doctrine stuff right. We want teachers who are saying the right things and who are teaching us the truth, and yet at the same time, James is saying, we've got to have people who are teaching the truth in a way, and exercising power and leadership in a way, that honors the way that Jesus did. So what's our tendency to misuse leadership and authority? How, how do we see power being abused in our culture today? What are the ways that we might be tempted in our church to take kind of cultural values of what it means to be a leader or what it means to be a teacher and to have authority and to bring that into here rather than kind of valuing the, the, the way that Jesus lived and taught, where he deeply loves people. There's a story over this last, uh, over this last six months of a pastor in the United States who was accused of inappropriate relationships with women over a period of about 20 years. And the response uh, of the, the people around him, his response and the response of the leaders around him was to quickly deny it and, and move to silence these women. The whole thing has fallen apart over the last couple of months, and I want to read you a statement from, from one of the elders as they recognize the ways that, uh, that they've gotten this wrong. <coughs> to all the women who have come forward, said one of the nine elders, we're sorry that we've added to your pain. We have no reason not to believe any of you. We are sorry that our initial statements were so insensitive, defensive, and reflexively protective of our pastor. We exhort our pastor to acknowledge his sin and publicly apologize. Be because of this issue, because of the way in which a church has used authority to elevate one person at the cost of others, their whole elders board has resigned, much of their pastoral staff have resigned, and this has become a national news item. The way that we're called to live and act as followers of Jesus in relation to authority and power is not that we use it to lift ourselves up, but that we use it to care for the poor and marginalized. I bring up this uncomfortable example because the kingdom of Jesus isn't meant to be like this. 
In the kingdom of Jesus, leaders are meant to be servants, impartial in their care for people. So that even marginalized people, even those bringing accusations against powerful people, are granted a voice and hearing. In the kingdom of Jesus, our love for people who are created in the image of God supersedes our desire to engage in marketing our image or advancing our political aspirations. We don't fight for power. Instead, we fight for justice. And we use our voices to support those who don't have power. So if I were to summarize what James is trying to talk about here, he says, leaders have an overly significant voice in the life of the body. And the temptation to seek authority like we see it in the culture around us can be overwhelming. James tells us that we all stumble in many ways, we're imperfect, but the church ought to be a place where a different kind of leadership, a different kind of teaching is exercised, where those with voices of authority seek to care for those who have little voice in the eyes of the world, where people don't seek leadership or teaching for the platform that it gives them, but out of a heart to serve. Where people don't seek leadership or teaching for the platform that it gives them, but out of a heart to serve. The second thing that we see in this passage is this. Like teachers, our words, our words have an outsized influence on our relationship and our world. Unfortunately, this influence is often bad, and none of us is able to master the power of our words. As James says, but no human being can tame the tongue. So it isn't just the words of leaders that matter, but all of our words have power. We know this from the hundreds of verses around the Bible that say this kind of thing explicitly, right? I spoke on uh, subjects similar to this from James a few weeks ago when we looked at some of the different Proverbs, but I mean, just to, just to highlight a few of the ways that the Bible lifts up the power of the tongue, Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Gentle words bring life and health, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. I like this one. A person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. And Proverbs 25, 18. I feel like this one is particularly important as I've got young kids, and I think I'm tempted often to remind them or to say to them that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Here's how Proverbs 25, 18 responds to that. Telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an axe, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Apparently sticks and stones will break. Uh, our words will actually hurt you uh, in the same way that an axe will. And Jesus says it perhaps most clearly. But I tell you that men and women will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. This seems really obvious, right? That, that words are powerful and have great power to do harm but, and also to do good. We know it not just because the Bible has a bunch of proverbs that tell us about the power of words, but we know it because we've experienced this, right? We've experienced, we, we, if we stop and think, we were talking on the way to church today about different ways that, different ways that we hold on to memories <laughs> of the hard words that we've heard. I can remember places where I was when somebody said something that was cutting or, or harsh. I can remember the feeling of those words, and perhaps you can as well. If we stop and think for a minute, there are, there are ways that we can remember hard words that we've heard. And then James says this. He's talking about words again. He says, with it, with our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. James grounds his complaint, his concern about the inconsistent, about our speech in the inconsistency between worshiping God and cursing those who are made in his image. He points out the logical inconsistency of loving God and hating those whom God expressly made to represent him. And I say this, this is a profound thought for me, that failure to recognize that each of us is created in God's image, it leads us to dark places. Again, this is a hardest thing to say on Thanksgiving. But as, I, as you think about the ways that people have failed to acknowledge the humanity of another, and the ways that that's led us astray as a culture, I, I took a course on, uh, on, on Latin American Christianity this past year, and one of the things that I had to do was read through debates within the church about whether the people that they were encountering in Latin America were fully human. Because if they weren't fully human, then we could enslave them. But if they were fully human, then maybe we have a responsibility towards them. And to think that 
failing to recognize somebody's humanity would lead you to the place where it would be acceptable to enslave them. I mean, that's, that, that's the story of the slave trade, uh, of the African slave trade as well, isn't it? It's a story of people failing to recognize the humanity of another and therefore feeling justified, feeling justified in treating them as less than human. And James points it out to us really clearly. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of our God. And I just want to reframe this to the positive and just say, if dehumanizing leads us to a place of disrespect and cursing and enslaving, then, then humanizing people, actually choosing to recognize that people are made in the image of God, brings us to a place where our speech towards them ought to change. I've been thinking about this over the last little bit. We've been talking a lot in our ministry about, uh, about rehumanization. How do, we, how do we humanize people? How do we actually choose to recognize the humanity of people? And I think it's led us to some funny conversations about how do you humanize the person who is, uh, who's in the checkout line ahead of you? And how do you humanize the, the neighbor that, uh, that's driving you nuts? What does it look like? To, how, does it, how does your frame on who they are change when you begin to actually look at them and recognize that they're people who are created in God's image? How, how does that change the way that you'd be tempted to speak to them? What does it mean to humanize the car that's driving beside you that just cuts you off? How does that change the reaction that you might have in that moment? This is probably a very useful conversation to have on Thanksgiving. In retrospect, uh, I'm heading to Ottawa after this. We're hopping in a car and driving down to Ottawa to sit around the table with a bunch of family members with whom I do not often agree on everything. What does it look like to humanize my family members with whom I have disagreements and history? What will it look like for you today to sit around the table with people that you don't always agree with, but to recognize that these are people who are created in the image of God, that they have inherent value and dignity, and that ought to influence the way. Caleb's looking at Peter, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> but what does it look like? How does that change the way that we would actually speak to one another to recognize that these are dearly loved people who are made in God's image, that they have value and dignity beyond their opinions? How does that change the way that we speak about people on Facebook who disagree with us when we go back to our echo chambers and, and check social media later on today? How will that change the way that we actually interact with people? So how will that change your speech today? being reminded of the inherent value and worth of people. I love the way C.S. Lewis says it. You've heard it a dozen times, but it applies deeply to this. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. <coughs> Immortal horrors are everlasting splendors. How does it change things when we begin to see people having inherent value and dignity? How does it change the way that we would speak to them? And finally, let me finish with this. Our inconsistency in speech isn't a side issue, but points to our need for deeper change, deeper transformation within. Because like water from a spring, our words flow forth from deep places. Does a spring flow forth, pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Listen, the way that this has convicted me as I've meditated on this this week is not just that I want to change a few things about how I talk, but it's pressed home to me, a deep desire that I have that my heart would be changed. That, that what would pour forth from my mouth would reflect deep transformation that's taken place in my heart. <coughs> Out of deep love for God and deep value for people, that that would be pressed so deep into my soul that it wouldn't be simply a matter of kind of zipping my mouth and saying, well, I'm just going to shut up now and not say that thing that I'm tempted to say, but that my heart wouldn't be tempted to say that thing because up from within there would be Passion and love and care and concern for people. What does it look like for us again to pursue transformation? Jesus says it this way, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. This is the challenge that we need to address. Not just that we would discipline our tongues, but that our hearts desperately need to change. That we want to become people who want good things to come forth from renewed hearts. 
This week I found myself in a meeting, uh, I'll be honest, I found myself in a couple meetings this week, uh, where I found the, the temperature rising in the meeting, and found myself getting caught up in anger and frustration, and said things that were insensitive. I could see the effect of my rash words on the people, and uh, I knew I had to go and make amends. But you know, I was telling Bonnie about this on Friday, my great frustration was that in the heat of these moments, that these were the kinds of things that would come up out of my heart. It's not just that I didn't discipline myself to shut my mouth. It's that in the heat of the moment, these were the kinds of things that come up out of my heart. My frustration isn't that I said the wrong thing, or that now I have to swallow my pride and go back and apologize. No, my frustration is that I long for the kind of inner transformation that results and change behavior in my words. I long for pure speech that flows from a pure heart. And I recognize that this is something that God can do in me. None of this minimizes my need to guard my tongue or discipline myself in tense situations to keep my mouth shut, but it does increase my desire for Jesus to come and bring change to my heart. So let's pray in that direction together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your patience with us as people who often say the wrong thing. Thank you for your patience and your, your grace with us as people who often seek power as a, as a way to, to control and influence rather than as a way to serve. Father, would you do a deep work in our heart that we would become people who recognize the humanity, the dignity of others because they are made in your image and that they are deeply loved by you. And Jesus, thank you that this brings us back to the gospel again and recognizing that we are deeply flawed and broken people. And we can bring that to you and know that there's forgiveness and grace when we confess our sins to you. So Father, we come again confessing and saying, have mercy. And we come and we ask, would you send your spirit in our hearts to renew and transform us, that we become people who increasingly reflect the character, the posture, the words, the love of Jesus, and the way that we interact with one another. And we lift all this up in Jesus.